Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Auburn Roundtable featuring online presentations and discussions about regional and state economic research. My name is Patrick Barkey. I direct the Bureau of Business and Economic Research at the University of Montana. It's been my honor to serve as president of Auburn, the Association for University Business and Economic Research, and to introduce this program. Thanks to the success of these roundtables, many of you now know that Auburn is a professional organization of university-based and other economic centers around the United States. We've been presenting these online roundtables over the last several weeks as a way of delivering the content and value that our in-person fall conferences normally provide. I invite you to visit our website, auburn.org, if you'd like to get in touch or learn more about us. Next week, we have another uh, Auburn Roundtable, which, as you can see on the slide, will feature a conversation about the impact of COVID-19 on real estate from a regional perspective. This discussion is going to be led, as you can see, by Dr. Louis Torres, who is a research economist at the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University. We invite you to uh, check your email and uh, sign up for what promises to be a valuable discussion. Today's roundtable is hugely relevant as we grapple to understand how economies around the country face the challenge of recovering from this historic economic downturn. Jeffrey Michael is Executive Director of the Center for Business and Policy Research in the Eberhardt School of Business and Professor of Public Policy in the McGeorge School of Law at the University of, Pacific, of the Pacific. A former Auburn board member, Jeff's area of expert, areas of expertise include regional economic forecasting, environmental economics, and land use regulation. Welcome, Jeff. The program is yours. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I'm, I'm the uh, moderator here today, so I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers and also just provide a couple of uh, ground rules of how we're going to progress. Uh, first of all, for people in the audience, uh, if you have questions, uh, and we, we're we hoping to have a robust discussion uh, here at the end of the presentations. Uh, enter your questions into the chat in Zoom, uh, and then we will uh, get to those uh, to, to help uh, our discussion. Uh, but before we do that, each of our speakers is gonna give a short about six minute presentation that talks about some of the conditions in, in their state that we've seen as a result of COVID. So, uh, very briefly, let me introduce uh, our distinguished speaker panel. Uh, our first speaker will be Eric Thompson, who's the director of the Bureau of Business Research at the University of Nebraska. Uh, Eric will be talking about Nebraska. After him, we'll move, move east. Uh, and we have Rod Modometti, who's the senior research manager at the University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute. Uh, following Rod, we are pleased to have Vanessa Fry who's the interim director of the Idaho Policy Institute uh, at Boise State University. And then our last speaker is Mervyn Jebaraj. He's director of the Center for Business and Economic Research at the University of Arkansas. So we have a nice variety of states uh, and uh, really insightful presentations and knowledgeable economists. So let's get right to the presentations. Uh, Eric, I think uh, you're first up. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you today about what's going on in the state of uh, Nebraska. Um, before I do that, or by way of explaining what we see in Nebraska, I'll talk about what factors, I guess the nature and severity of the COVID-19 recession. In other words, what factors influence how large the recession is in different states and uh, how quickly states might expect to recover. Um, so one way to look at it is COVID-19 mostly impacted businesses with the following characteristics, significant face-to-face -face interaction between customers and workers, assembly of large groups of customers that obviously uh, has affected us in Big Ten country recently uh, with uh, the canceling of the football season. That's certainly an example of an environment where there's large groups of customers clustered together at a, any sort of big event. And then anything linked to travel has been significantly impacted. So if you have an economy where all of these things are prominent in your economy, your state's probably going to get hit the hardest. So setting aside shutdown orders and how, how vigilant your state was with those shutdown orders, uh, 
uh, we expect a recession to be less severe in states, and think Nebraska here, where the severely impacted industries are a smaller share of the economy. So Nebraska is not a big tourism and uh, entertainment and recreation state. So that's a severely impacted industry. We don't have as much of our employment in there. Nebraska does have a lot of employment in what might be called essential industries. Obviously, I'm thinking about our food production here, but also just manufacturing. When these necessities are a larger part of the economy, you're probably going to stay open even during the COVID uh, recession. And then if there's more opportunities to work at home, Nebraska has a very large uh, insurance and uh, banking industry. So a lot of opportunities to work at home there. So uh, states with those characteristics like Nebraska might expect, might expect that they had a smaller decline in their economy. Now, what affects the pace of recovery? I see sort of two factors here. First of all, if, if people, once they feel safe or feel like they're good citizens, if they go back to their old spending patterns and old, old ways of buying people in businesses, um, if that's what they're going to do, you know, do they feel comfortable doing that yet? Um, obviously, there's different attitudes among people and then among the people who live in different states about how quickly they're going to get back to doing things just the way they used to. And then the severity of the COVID spread in the state is obviously a factor as well. But I think there's another factor at play here too. Maybe people will never go back or businesses to their old spending patterns. So uh, during the pandemic, they had to change the way they do things and maybe um, they learned some things because of that change and it's going to cause them to behave differently in the future. Now, if people change their spending patterns and if businesses change their manner of operation where they need different suppliers and spend their money on different things, well, we're going to have to develop a whole lot of, uh, we're going to have to grow and develop new types of businesses. And obviously the other part of that is get rid of some of the old types of businesses. And workers are going to have to find new occupations in some cases along with that change. Well, if that happens, if that's the kind of recovery we have, the recovery is going to be slower because we're going to, a nice way to say it is we're going to have a lot of structural unemployment as well as cyclical unemployment. So these are the things that I think will impact the recovery. Just to, to make that last point uh, again, you, you might think of the COVID-19 as an unwelcome learning opportunity. Well, a lot of us had to stay at home. We had no choice, but the change how we shop, change how we obtain goods and services. Businesses had to redesign their workspaces, uh, whether you know, cut back on travel, have people work at home. And the question is, what if businesses and consumers decide that all of that worked pretty well? That, that, that th those things they learned about. Uh, the businesses decide that working at home works pretty well, or uh, people have learned some new recipes and aren't gonna be interested in eating out quite as much. Um, if people decide it worked pretty well and they see a lot of opportunity to save money, we may see some permanent changes in their spending patterns and in bills and business operations. And that'll mean a restructuring economy as well as a slower recovery. Okay, so what have we seen in Nebraska? As I hinted at earlier, relative to the United States, Nebraska's had a less severe downturn because we're focused on the necessities in our economy. We have fewer of the hardest employment in your hardest hit industries, and uh, we have a lot of opportunities to work at home. Our recovery, however, has been pretty similar. We're not different in the ways I talked about in terms of the pace of the recovery. And the tax revenue situation is relatively strong in Nebraska. So here you see the change in non-farm employment. I have two overlapping periods here. What if you just look at February to April, uh, from the, the peak month to April when things were at their worst? And then we also compare February to June when the economy's had a chance to bounce back a little bit in terms of employment. So you can see Nebraska was, was hard hit, more hard hit than the average state, but both Nebraska and uh, the U.S. as a whole have gotten about a third of their employment back. So the pace of recovery has been pretty similar. And the numbers are very impressive for Nebraska in terms of tax revenue. Now, income tax, corporate income tax, that was all affected by changing dates and so forth or when taxes were due. So I'll focus on the sales tax. You can see by May, which really reflected the economy in April, the May tax revenue was down pretty substantially in Nebraska, but we had a big bounce back in June. I wish I had July, but clearly we haven't had a huge loss in tax revenue. Well, Jeff, those were the main points I wanted to make. Great, thank you, Eric, and you're uh, right on time. Um, 
And so uh, with that interesting look in Nebraska, let's go look at a very different uh, area of the country uh, that's had a, a different pattern in terms of how the pandemic and, and economy has evolved. So uh, traveling down to Massachusetts and uh, Rod Modamedi. So Rod, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about where we are as a state and where we're going. Massachusetts um, declared a state of emergency very early, uh, mid-May, or mid-March rather. We were kind of one of the early hotspots of uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, this slide you see here is from the state's reopening presentation that didn't actually happen until May 18th. So May 18th was the first time, uh, you know, roughly you know, two or three months after we had closed, that there was any conversation about what reopening was gonna look like. We are currently in phase three um, of this plan. And as you can see, based on what it says under phase four, we're going to be in phase three for a while. Phase four requires development of a vaccine or an effective treatment, which could be 12 months or more away for all we know. Um, so the quote unquote good thing about this is, is we actually have a pretty good sense right now of what our economy is going to look like for now. So we have a for now normal in terms of what the um, allowed and, and, and accepted scope of economic activity uh, is going to be. But as you can see here, um, this all depends on the health uh, metrics going the right way. So we've actually paused our reopening currently. Their phase three itself had two parts, and so we're not going into part two of phase three, and we could go backwards. Fortunately, um, our daily uh, metrics are actually looking pretty good. So the State Department of Public Health puts out a dashboard every day. There's a link to it up there about uh, how things are going in the state. So uh, here you can see what, what has been, what happened just yesterday, uh, about 230 confirmed new cases, uh, 18 new deaths, and you can see 8,500 total dead in a state of 6 million or so, um, you know, is a pretty substantial reflecting kind of the, our early hotspot. Uh, and the fact that it got into the residential care communities pretty early and, and wreaked havoc, um, which is also part of the reasons Massachusetts has such a high average case fatality has been because of uh, the nursing homes. But you can see we're doing tons of tests. Uh, you can get uh, on-demand tests in Massachusetts still, uh, and, that, uh, and that has helped. Here are some of our trends for the past uh, two months or so. Uh, so our... Um, Average uh, weighted positivity rate for testing is about 1.5%, which is um, where we want it to be. We want it to be below five here in Massachusetts. Um, you can see here the number of people we have hospitalized currently is not uh, a ton, 359. Um, we're not really over uh, supplied or over demanded on our hospitals. Uh, and the deaths, while you know any one death is too much, are you know have been below 15 or 20 basically a day for uh, two months or so. So we're kind of at a steady state. In terms of where we've seen the most incidents, uh, we've seen a really high correlation with uh, incidents in um, cities with uh, what we're calling crowded housing, so more than one occupant per room. Uh, the correlation there, as you can see, is very tight. Uh, those same uh, places also correlate very highly with our communities of color. So um, part of the explanation, at least in Massachusetts, for why we've seen much higher incidence in uh, minority communities uh, has been tied to the fact that socioeconomic conditions uh, for, those, uh, for those groups uh, tend to put them in uh, crowded housing, which uh, reduces the ability of social distance and, and uh, uh, quarantine cases. And then here we have what I have been calling the ice pick chart, for lack of a better word. Um, and you can see our employment has just tanked uh, during, um, the, uh, during the pandemic. It's only seen a little bit of an uptick there at the end, partly because we still are in a state of, of capacity restrictions, uh, mandatory masks, uh, and will be for a long time now. Um, our employment level currently is about where it was last in late 1996, 1997. So we've gone back you know, quite a bit uh, in terms of uh, our employment level uh, here in Massachusetts. So not great. Part of that has been due to our industry mix. Uh, our industry mix is heavily weighted in the kinds of industries that uh, have been 
hard hit. So contrary to what Eric was saying in Nebraska, um, we are heavily concentrated in sectors that are, are being just really brutalized by uh, the shutdowns and the pandemic generally. So healthcare, people think is doing great. It's actually not. It's doing very badly. Um, social assistance, forget about it, like childcare and everything else around that is, is pretty much shut down. Education services are bad and just about to get worse. Uh, retail, accommodation of food services, we all know about. Professional and technical services here in Massachusetts is a bit of a balance. Uh, able to work from home, and not necessarily dependent on in-person contact, but on the flip side, Massachusetts is quite export dependent. Uh, and so insofar as national and global economies are weak, uh, it's going to continue to hurt us here. And another uh, avenue uh, where it's kind of under the radar uh, is uh, a, perhaps a long-term threat to the population, uh, economic uh, well-being here in Massachusetts is that we rely heavily on international, migra international migration for population growth. In fact, without international migration, the population of Massachusetts would be declining. Uh, and with the uh, recent um, crackdowns on migration and the basic, basically essentially shut down now during uh, the pandemic, uh, that could have a long-term effect on um, our labor force, our tax base, uh, and frankly, a lot of the uh, innovation that Massachusetts is known for, a lot of that is based on our uh, international migration. And then lastly, we'll talk about where we are fiscally. The tax picture is quite kind of muddy right now, which is why I didn't really pull up a slide on it. Um, the, the state kind of refuses to put together a full year budget. Uh, so they don't, you know, they don't even know what the tax revenue situation is. Uh, they've only put out a budget that goes until October. Uh, but in terms of our rainy day fund, we are kind of mid, little, mid pack, a little bit above average um, with uh, a rainy day fund that covers almost 10% of our general fund expenditures, um, which actually puts us at a tie and a fantastic segue uh, with Idaho uh, and handing it over to Vanessa. Thanks, Rod. I, I was just thinking a couple of your slides. Gosh, I wish I had that in my slide deck, but you, you've you got it. So it was a, a perfect handoff. Yeah, Rod, thanks for doing my job. Uh, next, we have uh, Vanessa uh, Fry from uh, Boise State University to tell us about uh, the Idaho economy. So, Vanessa. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And a uh, pleasure to be here with you all today. So Vanessa Fry, I'm the interim director of the Idaho Policy Institute. We founded, we were founded about four years ago now with the sole purpose of being a resource for Idaho's decision makers. And gosh, we've had some fun this year with all kinds of requests for, for modeling and predictions. And I have to keep on saying any, anything we do is wrong. It just depending on how wrong it's going to be, right? And when we think about modeling. So uh, let me give you a sense of what COVID has been like in our state. So here's a, um, a kind of a, a weekly projection, or not projection, actually reality of, of what COVID looks like in Idaho. We were one of the, the last states to have confirmed cases. And I was curious at first, is that just because we're not testing or, you know, are we, do we really not have cases here? I think in part it was we, weren't, we didn't have access to tests as readily as some of the other states did originally. But you can see that we had um, really no confirmed cases until, until late February. Um, and then at one point in time, we were the, the hot spot of the nation, Blaine County, where Sun Valley, the resort town is located, had a huge spike. And we were the, um, had, had one of the hottest uh, spots in, in the country for a period of time. Uh, and at the, at the time in the spring, if you look to the far left of this graph, you know, this is when we, um, as a state, there was a, an effort that was developed called Crush the Curve, right? And so we were really thrilled that we were able to do our, um, we had a stay at home order put in place that was uh, uh, across the state and people really abided by that and we were able to bring down the curve. Now we have all, also have a, a four phases of, of reopening our economy and as those um, doors reopened, you can see what happened here. And so we are still um, really kind of fighting those, those ongoing cases. These are the date of onset. So these aren't the reported cases yet. And so we're, it's kind of, there's a little bit of a lag because we're kind of looking back for we know when the onset is. This kind of gives you a sense of, of where we are and where the hot spots are. And um, like Rod said, in the, in the more densely populated areas, those are where you see on the, on the right, that map, those are the, the, uh, the metropolitan metropolitan uh, organization, planning organization locations in the state of Idaho. 
So in all, all in all, we're not a very dense state, but those places where we do have uh, relative levels of density are, um, have been hit harder. And you can see on the, on the left, the number of cases by week. So as the, um, the circle kind of grows larger, that's, we're seeing more and more cases there. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Idaho, when you look at the, the map there on the right, uh, I'm seated in an Ada County, and that's the, um, the red, there's two red kind of on the far west side of the state, Ada and Canyon County, that's the largest populated area in the state that we call the Treasure Valley. Um, so what have um, unemployment claims looked like? So what I did is I uh, um, have a little time series here. So this is before we really saw any effect of COVID here. So we are actually doing really well. Our economy has been booming. People are moving here. We can hardly keep up with it. Our housing vacancy rate is, um, in here in Ada County is below 1%, which essentially means you cannot find a home. What we're seeing is people that are coming into the state with cash and, uh, and buying homes for over asking price, right? So uh, we're having a a big kind of tussle in our housing market. And, um, and, and this is, you know, this was happening pre-COVID. Um, and then, uh, so when COVID did uh, happen, the governor really was quick to react. We're, um, as, as you probably know, we're a rather conservative state, um, socially and fiscally. And, and the governor immediately made some requests to, uh, for everyone to tighten their belts. So this is, across the, the communities and he made a specific um, mandate for all state agencies. So like Boise State University where I am, we needed to cut our, our budget by 5%. And so we did that. And because of that, we are actually, um, our revenue projections um, are, and our, um, where we thought we'd be at this time pre-COVID, we're, we're three times better as far as the state economy goes. And that's with our, our rainy day fund and our, our revenue. So then COVID hits, right? And so you can see this was the spike that we had. So the weekly number of um, unemployment claims here. And you know, that shot up. And when I look at uh, the, the sectors of the economy that were most impacted, and this is, um, goes to what Eric was talking about, uh, I would say in, we have much uh, similarities between Nebraska and Idaho as far as we're a very agriculture oriented state. Uh, we also have a high level of service industry in the, um, the resort areas and in the more um, concentrated uh, areas of density like Ada County. So when we look at what the claims were originally, these are all, a lot of service workers, right? So many service workers. This is when the stay at home order was happening. Um, and then you can kind of see where we're at today. So we have that high level of unemployment claims and we've really come down and we've actually seen quite a bit of recovery in the service industry it seems that as soon as other states opened and Idaho opened, everyone decided to come here for vacation. And so we see these resort communities that are doing really well, almost to the point that they can't handle the number of people that are coming, coming into the communities. Um, and we are still trying to get a hold on the number of new cases that we have as far as uh, diagnosed COVID cases go. And as I mentioned to my, my fellow uh, panel participants before we went live, it's uh, become a very politicized issue in the state, uh, wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. And it seems to certainly be affecting the um, ongoing rate of, of cases that we have. So I will stop there and move on to our next panelist. Terrific. Uh, everyone's doing a great job of, of staying on time so far. So uh, our final uh, panelist, uh, Mervyn Jevaraj uh, from the Center for Business and Economic Research at the University of Arkansas, which happens to be the only university in our panel that as of now is still playing uh, football this fall. So um, Mervyn, uh, tell us about the Ar Arkansas economy. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that Arkansas had a terrible football season last year, and the SEC season that was published pretty much puts us on course for a 10 and 0 season. So I think there are more than a few people uh, hoping that we don't actually go through with this season, because uh, if you combine our losses this year that we expect to have this year and all the losses last year, we might go on a 20 game losing streak or something like that. So nobody wants that. Um, so 
I'm not going to talk about football. Um, I, if I were putting money down today, I'd probably bet that we were not going to play the season out and that the SEC is just uh, waiting uh, to uh, postpone or cancel or something, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how many cases we've had. So Arkansas is actually, if you, in terms of cumulative cases so on a per capita basis, we're probably the 16th worst state. Uh, we don't get a lot of attention because there's not as many in terms of sheer numbers, but at least over the past month or so, uh, we have averaged uh, something like 700 to 800 cases, new cases every single day, uh, which on a per capita basis on many of those weeks has been worse than Texas, which is a state that gets a lot more attention for having a bad outbreak. So, uh, you know, even though it's not in the national news, there is quite a bit of an outbreak here in Arkansas. Uh, especially in the big metro areas and then some non-metro areas where there's a lot of uh, poultry processing going on. So um, nonetheless, uh, from an employment perspective, uh, we did lose something like 118,000 jobs uh, between uh, uh, February and April. We gained about 46,000 of those jobs back. Uh, our unemployment rate currently is about 8%, uh, percent, uh, but our labor force participation rate has declined significantly. So uh, there are a lot more people that are not working and uh, not being counted as unemployed. Um, I just wanted to show, I guess everybody, or as most of you have probably seen some of these stats uh, from tracktherecovery.org. This has been my favorite website, uh, unfortunately, I guess, uh, during this pandemic uh, to try to get sort of weekly data and sort of relying on sort of, you know, one month old data from uh, federal government websites. Uh, but this gives you, you know, this shows you a percentage change in consumer spending. Uh, this is a state that is popular among policymakers uh, in Arkansas, especially because it shows that, uh, you know, the amount of consumer spending in Arkansas has been somewhere on the top end of the distribution of the states. Um, and uh, so these are, if you can see all these gray lines, these are all the 50 states. Arkansas has various points has been, you know, at the very top or within the top three or four uh, states in the country and often has been attributed to the fact that Arkansas was one of the states that did not have a stay-at-home order. So uh, these are all the states, as far as I could tell, that did not have a stay-at-home order, all these states here. Uh, some of them had local stay-at-home orders. Uh, but if you actually look at their consumer spending, there doesn't seem to be much of a relationship. Arkansas still outperforms most of the states that did not have uh, stay-at-home orders. And so South Dakota, for example, did not have a stay-at-home order is somewhere at the bottom end of the distribution of increases in consumer spending. And I think when we consider why that might be the case, I think it's because Arkansas has a lower cost of living, is a lower income state uh, than most other states. And uh, the stimulus that was passed had far bigger effect here in Arkansas than it did in other states. Um, particularly if you were unemployed uh, in Arkansas, you're the $600 weekly bonus uh, was at, you know, made your income somewhere around 120 to up to 180% of the income that you were receiving while you were working. Um, so obviously, if you're looking at this uh, roughly when the unemployment claims started being processed and the stimulus checks hit, uh, you see a significant increase in spending in low and middle income households. Uh, high income households did spend some more money, but they're still spending significantly less money than they were. Um, I did not put this chart up here, but I also have a chart that shows, uh, you know, percentage of people going to workplaces uh, across the board, especially in high income counties in the state. Uh, the number of people going to work is still at an all time low. It hasn't really improved. It improved very briefly in mid May and then declined and is in some cases worse. Uh, the number of people going to work and so especially the high income households that have maintained their jobs and are sitting at home and working from home are spending a lot less money out there and so when we look at what's going on in our state for sales tax collections uh, you know the state as a whole is doing modestly better uh, this month and last month than they did last year at the same time period in part because uh, Starting in July last year, we started collecting uh, online sales taxes, which has come in very handy at this uh, particular time. And also because, uh, especially a lot of lower income parts of our state, you're seeing a lot more consumer spending in, especially in apparel and merchandise categories. Now, 
Uh, what you see happening, obviously, is that those unemployment benefits cut off in many cases uh, for many households in the last week of July and definitely at the end of July. And you see a drop off. It's almost immediate in terms of how much they're spending on apparel and merchandise. Uh, same thing in this previous chart. If you look at low and middle income households, they were spending a lot more money and then it dropped off significantly in the last week of July. And uh, so given that that's uh, the case right now, and we don't see prospects for uh, a new uh, unemployment benefit, it probably means that uh, consumer spending and taxes are probably going to decline uh, for the first time significantly in the state, which hasn't seen that so far. I just want to show some of this stuff, small business, number of small businesses open, uh, slightly outperformed uh, the state, uh, the nation as a whole. Uh, but again, you see significant drop off in the leisure and hospitality industry and the retail. Uh, most of this improvement was immediately after the state allowed leisure and hospitality businesses to open. They ramped up to Memorial Day, dropped off, ramped up for July 4th, dropped off since then. Um, and then small business revenue, even though many businesses were open, their revenue still got hit. This is in the top third of the distribution of states. And leisure and hospitality in particular has been harder hit. Uh, most of the leisure and hospitality industry investments went in sort of the high income counties, high income cities of our state, and they're the ones that are being hardest hit right now. And then finally, again, this shows you uh, small business revenue by income of where they're based. Uh, once again, you see, you know, the high income, the businesses in high income areas certainly taking a much bigger revenue hit uh, than businesses in low and middle income areas. And I will stop there and we will take questions. Or pass it back to Jeff and Jeff will decide what we'll do. We will take questions, exactly. Um, so thank you, Mervin. And um, looking in the, in the chat, uh, you know, we've got a joke about Arkansas football, but Mer Mervyn uh, didn't show too much confidence. So uh, there's also a, uh, a question about taxes. So a lot of people um, made comments about sales tax uh, revenue and collections, and certainly sales tax and consumer spending has been hit. Uh, I think for most of us, maybe not as bad as we initially feared. Uh, but another big source of tax revenue for, for uh, most states are income tax. So uh, question, uh, any of the panelists, have, have you been looking at income tax withholding and income tax receipts in your state and how, are the, how is that holding up? I can speak a little bit to what Idaho did to facilitate uh, income tax collection a little bit more smoothly. So we pushed the, the filing date back to June 15th, but that still was within the state's fiscal year. And so, um, and I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me to see, you know, relative to all the revenue expected, how um, that may have shrunk compared to what we anticipated. But we did have a, a surplus nearly, nearly three times what we expected, and that was what we expected before COVID-19. Now, that was also with our holdbacks, but um, I don't think that income tax collection in Idaho had significant, as significant an impact as we thought it might. But I think it really had to do with um, pushing that filing date back. Uh, I think Arkansas pushed our uh, income tax filing date to July 15th to match the federal government. And, you know, we had a spike in July 15th compared to last year, but that's almost entirely because of the collection date moving. But again, uh, since most people are indeed paying income taxes on their unemployment claims and those income taxes are being charged on a much higher rate of income than most of those workers were being charged uh, while they were working, you know, the state's income tax picture hasn't uh, been affected a whole lot either. I think uh, we mentioned earlier before this panel started was that uh, the sales tax picture overall for the state hasn't been affected, but in the bigger cities, especially we've seen sales tax declines that are significant and a lot of cities that fund uh, various programs with hotel, motel, restaurant taxes have certainly taken a beating. Yeah, here in Massachusetts, as I said, the tax picture is kind of muddy for all of the reasons that people had said we pushed our uh, filing date back to July 15th. No one really knows what to expect. But I can say that not only is the tax picture a bit muddy, but how it lines up with unemployment is also a bit odd as well in the sense that Massachusetts actually has the highest unemployment rate uh, in all, of all the states uh, going right now, um, which is funny because just a few months ago, we had one of the lowest. 
uh, in the country. And so part of that comes to down to our st economic structure and industry mix and so on, as I mentioned, but part of it has to do with our unemployment system that is, keeps people um, sort of engaged. And so we don't have as many people uh, who are discouraged and dropping off the rolls. And so it keeps our unemployment numbers high. Uh, and so all of these things together, I think nobody really knows how it's all gonna shake out which has paralyzed a lot of fiscal decision-making as a result as well. Yeah, I think it, that's an example of a policy change that has made uh, the forecasting models so all uh, based on historical data, uh, changes like that makes it a lot more difficult uh, going forward. Um, I'm going to um, ask a question. Uh, uh, I think, Rod, you may have touched on the issue of inequality, and maybe this is coming from my California perspective where we've seen some, uh, we've uh, uh, had a steady impact the whole whole time. We've seen a little bit of a spike, uh, but one of the things we've shifted is in seeing um, the, the geographic and the socioeconomic uh, pattern of the, uh, of the pandemic. So um, we've seen a, um, uh, some change with respect to inequality in, in communities. And I'm curious if that's a, a pattern that's been seen nationwide where where uh, the pandemic and some of the health and economic effects have sort of moved from urban centers uh, uh, and high income centers out into more rural or lower income areas. Um, for us, you know, as I said, the, the correlation is strongest with number of people in a housing unit. Um, more so than poverty level. So uh, the correlation of, of, you know, infection rates um, doesn't tie as much to that. So um, at least here in Massachusetts. So in our rural communities tend to be quite spread out and, you know, people aren't really mixing. So um, for us, it, it does, it has been, uh, you know, where are a, a high representation of frontline health workers uh, and then where do we have people who are um, living in, in um, you know, more than one person per bedroom housing where you can't separate from each other and, you know, infection rates are high. I mean, some of the stuff that's coming out of the WHO, I think, was something like 70% of people with COVID don't infect anybody. 10% uh, uh, infect somebody in their households. And then you have the other 20% of these big super spreader events, like one person infects a ton of people at some kind of gathering. And so for us, you, know, you don't have to worry about the 70% that aren't infecting anybody. And then we've locked down everything still. So we're not really getting a lot of super spreader events, which just leaves that inter-household inter spread, um, which is showing up in, in communities, which tend to be communities of color here in Massachusetts, that there are a lot of people living in one housing unit. Right. Yeah. So we've certainly in California, we've seen um, uh, a lot of cases of, of workplace uh, transmission uh, amongst the uh, uh, um, essential workers and places uh, where people still have to go to work and they're working in close proximity. Uh, and so the, the virus has really sort of moved from the some of the urban areas and into the Central Valley and uh, some of the lower income areas and uh, in a in a big way. Um, um, yeah. Another, uh, as Mervyn yeah. indicated, the, the mm -hmm. in Arkansas as well, the the, the uh, communities with uh, large meat processing facilities have had very high so, uh, rates. Yeah, and, and so in our case, it's a little bit mixed. So the rural areas do have some meat processing facilities, and that's where you see big clusters. But up where we are, which is uh, the second largest urban area in the state also has a huge meat processing cluster and has seen an outbreak related to that happen. So uh, in that sense, it's a little bit mixed, but obviously the communities that it affects are very much lower income. Most of them are still working, um, you know, and they certainly had a variety of issues in addition to uh, facing a coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, when you look at the cases in Idaho, so 7% of Idahoans identify as people of color, but 27% of the cases in Idaho have been um, people of color. So it just kind of gives you a really stark um, look at the um, discrepancies there. Yeah. And, and our, 
Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Herbert. Yeah. So our state has, you know, not a very high percentage of uh, Hispanic or Latino population, and certainly not, you know, as a percentage of population, the Marshallese uh, population here is very low. But uh, the case rates among those populations are incredibly high, and that is very much correlated to the meat processing. The other thing, obviously, we have huge outbreak in prisons here. Uh, probably one of the worst, actually, in the country. So that's that's definitely adding up to our caseload too. I was just going to say that when looking at the uh, the results in Massachusetts, which that link that was in my presentation, that uh, dashboard breaks all this down. But some of our stats have been skewed by the our nursing home outbreaks, and so we actually have far more female fatalities than male, uh, and uh, a lot of white, um, and that tends to be because of the nursing homes, uh, you know, women tend to live longer, so there tends to be more of them in nursing homes, uh, and they tend to be white. Uh, and so if you look at it more by age breakdown, then you start seeing a lot more of the overrepresentation of, of people of color in our, in our stats. I'm going to uh, jump to another question from the chat. I think a, a big issue nationwide right now is surrounds uh, school openings. Uh, certainly, it's a, it's a, uh, a big issue in the news and, and a lot of uncertainty and differences and in, in how different places are, approach it. Uh, and, uh, you know, our discussions about the economy, you know, so school openings can have a lot of uh, indirect effects on economic activity uh, in an area as well. So uh, any comments about uh, how school openings are progressing in your communities and some of the potential uh, economic and other effects of that? I can talk about the effect on me as a parent. <laughs> I know. think that's very relevant. Right, that's, right. That's, I mean, yeah. so I think about that. So, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to be a university professor. I have an opportunity to work from home. Uh, I'm still stressed out that my kids are going to be here doing online education for at least the next three weeks. So, and what Idaho has um, allowed is for districts are um, it's a district by district decision is what's going on in, in Idaho. And we have everything from full face-to-face -face in person to completely online for a period of time um, and everything in between. Um, some of the uh, jurisdictions have allowed the students to either choose to uh, enroll completely for the semester online or uh, enroll in their school with the uh, possibility of going in person at some point in time during the semester. But I think what is happening, um, and I'm really curious to see that what happens with the economy. I think there's so much uncertainty from parents and the students. Um, and I think it's not gonna be a smooth transition from summer to school because we're gonna lose a lot of those childcare opportunities that uh, camps and whatnot were, were offering um, across the state. And then the universities are, are also um, gonna be impacted. So Boise State's at a 60% uh, face-to-face enrollment with, um, with no football season. And so now we just found out about that and trying to project how that lack of a football season and the associated TV contracts is gonna impact, impact not just the university, but the city of Boise and the surrounding area. Yeah, so, so labor force effects are, are one of the big issues with uh, uh, school closures. And um, um, so that's certainly one policy change. We have the changes in the unemployment insurance also. So. Uh, is this uh, disrupting business, uh, the uncertainty around schools? I can tell you the college being closed here, you know, Amherst, the flagship campus, and all of the things that's going on there. Uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, the unemployment rate is over 30% currently, um, which is, puts it, you know, among the worst in the state, in the state that's already doing, I think our state unemployment rate is right currently, it's like 15%, 14, 15%. Um, and then you have within that pockets like Amherst where, you know, like I said, it's over 30% and there's no reason that that should fall given that college is gonna be mostly online. So, I mean, it's hollowing out places like that. Mm -hmm. So, so Rod, I have a, uh, you're on there, I'm gonna keep picking on you because one of the things I noticed I, is- I like uh, the sound of my own voice. Yeah, is, uh, uh, I mean, your COVID rates in Massachusetts were so high very early on and fatality rates, you know, right behind New York and New Jersey. Uh, but the data you were showing recently, you know, you, new case rates in the in the hundreds, you know, I, uh, we don't even have counties anywhere near that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. They're incredibly low, uh, yet Massachusetts is, is, is maintaining a really high level of uh, uh, restrictions on activity. I think in California, if our case rates got anywhere near where you uh, were, we, we would be reopening a lot of activity again. 
So I was just wondering how, um, is there starting to, is there a lot of public acceptance of that? Or you know, when you talk about a place like Amherst having 30% unemployment in the state at 17% unemployment, uh, I'm, are, uh, what's the political pressure look like that given that you've been very successful at, at uh, reducing the curve? Um, you know, you don't see a lot of the, you know, I don't want to wear a mask because it's my right kind of situation. I mean, you do, but not that bad. I think what has helped is that from the very beginning of the process, the communication has been very clear from the governor. Mm -hmm. um, it was, he initially got a lot of criticism for moving too slow. And I think that deliberateness has actually come to be quite the help now that from the very beginning, we got the reopening plan, you know, after two months of being shut down, it was very clear that each phase is going to take at least three weeks. We will only move forward if the health criteria are met. We will go backwards if the health criteria are not met. These are the criteria. You need to do these things. And so, you know, if you speak to people like they're a bunch of irresponsible idiots, then they seem to act like responsible smart people. You know, so rather than saying, we trust you to make smart decisions, it was, these are the things that ha are going to happen and these are the criteria. And if it's not these things, then you don't get, you know, you don't get your dessert. So I think it has helped that there has been very little waffling uh, and very clear communication from policymakers in the state that it's, these are my expectations of you, these are your expectations of us, and I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain. Right. So uh, a question coming from the chat that I think is a good segue from this is, and a question that I've faced a lot is uh, as we look at the recovery and the economic impacts, how much of it is the virus itself? How much of it is policy and, and uh, regulatory effects? Uh, and how much is other things uh, related to it? So uh, I think that's a, a, the question is aside from the virus itself, uh, what is the biggest hurdle for recovery in your state? And maybe, maybe I'll let Rod off the hook and let someone else uh, jump in here. Well, I, I think increasingly it is about the virus now. Um, in, in many states, the, the official limitations are, um, are rather light in a lot of places now. And it's, it's a matter of what, what people choose to do. And again, will they bounce back to their previous spending patterns? Will they hold back? or will they spend, but in a very different way, um, which will affect getting people back to work and dealing with creating a larger problem with structural unemployment. Yeah, I think given the sudden lack of federal support for businesses in particular, I think the big concern is that a lot of businesses would go down, especially in the leisure and hospitality industry, um, you know, where we are, it's still a guess whether we're going to play. I mean, officially we're playing football this year, um, but you know, th that doesn't mean people are necessarily going to come in large quantities. Uh, a, because probably the team's going to get beat pretty bad. And that happened last year too. <laughs> and B, because they're going to be social distancing guidelines in the stadiums and so on and so forth. So uh, usually the bars and restaurants in town make up uh, their lack of summer, uh, you know, in the fall. That does not seem like it's happening. Most of the major fall events other than the football games have been canceled. Uh, most of the major spring events got canceled too. So, you know, think those bars and restaurants were on life support with the PPP loans. Most of them followed the rules as they were initially uh, published to use them uh, within the time frame. So most of that money is gone. Uh, and as a result, they're letting their workers go. And, you know, you really haven't seen people return to dining, even though, you know, restaurants are allowed to operate at two thirds capacity. It's just not happening because people don't want to go. When I think about it, it like it's sure there's recovery, but I don't think anyone thinks we're going to look like what we looked like before. Right. And so what is going to change and what are those uh, those kind of institutions, businesses that are in place that have that are um, able to pivot, that are resilient, that are creative and able to, to react quicker. So you see the, the, the restaurants and the chains that really reacted quickly to curbside delivery that were going to change it. And they kept on going. You, you start, I think it was Chipotle that like just kept on opening new restaurants, right, right in the middle of this because they, they all of a sudden went to this different um, mode of delivery. So I think part of it is going to be like, 
less about the question of recovery, but how's the economy going to change? And, you know, maybe get up to the same level of, of, of movement, but it's going to be different. And I think um, when I think of the, you know, high rise downtown um, uh, businesses, right, with hundreds and hundreds of workers, like that might not, that might not be a thing anymore, right? And how's that going to affect the large urban centers across the country when uh, they realize, gosh, we can do just as well with our, our employees working remotely, perhaps we have to pay them less because they don't have to be in San Francisco. And you know, what are those long-term effects gonna be? And I think it's really uh, fascinating to, to think through that, but really hard to model too, because a lot of it is behavior change. Yeah, so uh, consumer uh, behavior and confidence and psyche is, is very important, both in the short, uh, short run, or, you know, how are people feeling and, and how are they gonna spend and behave? And also in the long run, are there gonna be permanent uh, pattern uh, shifts. Uh, I did want to, uh, we, we, we talked a, a good bit about local policy and the variation and in, in rules and restrictions locally. I haven't talked a, a lot about federal policy and the recovery. Mervin brought up uh, small businesses and uh, one thing we've seen in a lot of the data is uh, uh, while consumer spending uh, is at one level, small business revenue is not, has not recovered as well as consumer spending has in most communities. Uh, and um, and we, you know, the federal policy response to help small businesses, the PPE program is expired. So uh, just a, a question of any, any observations you're having about small businesses and uh, how they're doing and their role in the recovery going forward. Well, I think the ways the economy has changed or the consumer and business spending patterns have changed are to the advantage of larger businesses and the disadvantage of small businesses. So I, I think we'll continue to see a booming stock market and statistics like Mervin presented with regard could, to small business. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit more, Eric, like how it advantages large businesses? Well, People shop a lot lar larger share of that consumer dollar is at is at Amazon mm -hmm. rather than the local franchises and standalone stores. Mm -hmm. um, you know, grocery stores tend to be large chains, restaurants, it's more of a mixed picture. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot more people going to Home Depot and Lowe's and not necessarily going to the smaller, you know, yeah. smaller businesses and definitely not returning to restaurants for indoor dining in any significant way. So, um, you know, a lot of restaurants I've actually seen open, uh, stay open for a couple of weeks and then close and switch back to just doing curbside or delivery because their overhead is a lot lower when they do that than trying to maintain an a la carte, a full a la carte menu uh, for supposedly two thirds capacity, but hardly anybody shows up to sit inside. I think, I think part of, you know, what you're saying is what's helped the western part of Massachusetts, which is significantly less put, put dense uh, than the eastern part of the state, I think survived some of this uh, a, a lot better. Um, there's still quite a lot of sort of towny culture here. You know, it's, it's not a high migration area, um, unlike, you know, Boston and so on. So there is this aspect of, you know, this is really bad, but we're all in this together sort of sense, which I think also helps with some of the, the sticking to the guidelines. But there, I have noticed a lot of talk of normally I would buy such and such thing from from, you know, this place. But is there, you know, is there a local business I can buy this from? You know, is there a place that I can go buy such and such thing from there? There has been. There has been an effort to try to help each other out by putting your dollars every time you spend, you know, every time you spend a dollar, you're voting for kind of the world you want to live in. Right. So like, you know, I think people understand that and they're at least, you know, they're saying, well, if I have a dollar to spend in a place here, I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm not saying that's perfect, but you, I have seen more and more of that talk in Western Massachusetts. Right. Um, well, I, the other thing is, I mean, a re recession is a period where you're a lot of structural change is supposed to happen. Right. No, I mean, this isn't a recession only. There's obviously this huge health component to it and, and huge change in the lifestyle that's been required. But uh, these sorts of changes, the, you know, the movement of the strongest businesses, the destruction of the weak businesses, 
a lot of that happens in our society during recession. And so we may, may be seeing it now. Yeah. Um, so I've got uh, a final question, but before I get to that, uh, another one that's uh, came in on the chat relative to uh, to health and to to data. Uh, and the question is, would the economy be better served by tracking the people sick enough to be hospitalized rather than just the positive cases? Uh, and talking about how testing can affect numbers. And so. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, are the indicators, the health indicators that we focus on, uh, you know, in the media and the news and by the, the public, uh, can that affect uh, uh, the economy? And if we focus more on hospitalization, uh, would that be beneficial? I think that's why we've been focusing on case positivity right here, mm -hmm. rather than just total testing volume or testing positivity rate as a proxy for Kind of adjusting for testing volume that you know we want our positivity rate to be under five percent uh, you know to indicate that we're doing enough testing to actually find the people who are sick mm -hmm. yeah and idaho really started looking at the burden on the healthcare system too so initially that wasn't something that we were doing but as far as the the phases of opening go that was one of the requirements was to look at the the burden on the the healthcare system and so that's become more prevalent across the entire state I think that's something we've seen in, in California too, that the, I think the policymakers, the decision makers are focusing and have shifted on indicators like hospitalization uh, rates and ICUs and capacities as, as sort of their benchmarks and triggers are using for decisions. Uh, but I think uh, the news and the public is still very much focused on the, uh, the case rates that sort of lead off every uh, newscast and in, in, in presentation. Um, I have one final question uh, for each of you, and uh, that's um, asking you if there, is there something in this process that you, an outcome or, or an impact that you found uh, most surprising in your state? And may, maybe we'll uh, go back to the original order and, and start with Eric. Uh, any any uh, surprising outcomes? I've been a little surprised. Of, uh, it's hard in a smaller state, like Mervyn said, you don't necessarily get the attention for the, the cases or hospitalizations that you're having. But I've been a little surprised the, the tolerance people have had for, for uh, bad, concerning health outcomes mm -hmm. in our state. Okay, and we, we've got two minutes left, so if anybody else has that wants to talk about their surprise very briefly before we wrap up. All right, I'll go with uh, interstate coordination, which has been a problem here in New England for a lot of things, but somehow people have gotten their act together and there's a lot of bit of communication around synchronizing reopening, synchronizing shutdowns, synchronizing policies, so that these small states with very porous borders are functioning a bit more like a unit. Yeah, I think Arkansas started trying to do that as well. So work with surrounding states to get materials specifically because, you know, it's been four or five months now since it started and we still have testing capacity issues. Oh, interesting. So collaboration among states. Uh, Vanessa, any surprises? Yeah, well, so our housing economy was, uh, market was really strong before and it's even stronger now. So I think that it hasn't slowed down certainly the rate of people wanting to to move into the into the state or into the urbanized areas from the rural areas of the state and i think we're going to continue to see a, a spike in the the urban centers um out migration to communities like boise yeah they're going right by my house on i-80 in california <laughs> headed to, yeah, Bose, to, headed to boise yeah. Yeah. um all right uh mervin uh you get the last word i believe Oh, I already put my word in, so we're good. <laughs> your, your word is in. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we are at, at time uh, for one hour. I don't know if, if Patrick wants to jump back in and, and say anything, um, but uh, I believe uh, if Patrick isn't jumping in to say anything, that's the end of our roundtable today. Uh, and we're really pleased, everybody that joined us, all the questions, and especially uh, to our panelists, uh, maybe a little electronic applause uh, for their uh, insights and participation today. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. 